Bonsoir, good evening, guten Abend. Schön, dass Sie auch bei dem wunderbaren Wetter hergekommen sind. Wir haben heute auch extra die Fenster offen gelassen. We let the windows open so that we all have a little bit of daylight here. I'm very happy um, to um, welcome you here tonight. This um, talk will be in English, so I hope you knew already, otherwise now you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Tina Ellerkamp. I'm one of the two founders of Silent Green. Um, in fact, in 2013, my beloved Jörg, he uh, found that building and it was empty and the Berlin Senate didn't know what to do with it and then he fell in love and felt like, um, okay, we are filmmakers, we are uh, cultural, um, we, we did a lot of projects in different cultural um, um, things and so we thought, let's try to make a cultural place out of this. So that's what we did and that's why we're here now. And um, when I was, I, I mean, you know the story already, but I will tell again, when I was um, for, my 40, for my 40th birthday, which is quite a while ago now, um, I was invited to Paris by Jörg and um, there was this wonderful exhibition by Agnes Wada in Fondation Cartier in the Contemporain and uh, I, I always admired and adored the film work by Agnes Wada and knew uh, some of her photographs, but I was not aware that she had also done so um, joyful, wonderful, touching, moving um, installations. And um, since then, I dreamt to get those work, this, this work, get those um, installations to Berlin, even though I did not even know that there would ever be silent green in my life. But when this both came together, I started um, talking to Stephanie um, with uh, Stephanie schulte strathaus from Arsenal, with whom we um, built up a small um, group called Filmfeld Forschung, Film Field Research. We did some project to get projects together here at Silent Green already, like Stoffwechsel or last year The Garden, um, based on a film by Derek Jarman. And um, yeah, and uh, I always told her, Stephanie, don't you know anyone around Agnes Wada because you have made those great retrospective. You must know someone. And then suddenly, out of nothing, she said, of course, I know Dominique Bluher. She's working for us for the forum. And so um, that's how the contact came. And uh, you came to our place and you understood from the beginning on what we are trying to do here. We always say we are more or less the guards of this place, so we are all, you said you're not curators anymore, but here you are curators, and this fits completely to what we and our team do here also. So um, tonight, um, Dominique Bleuher and Julia Fabry, the uh, two curators of this wonderful exhibition here in, at Silent Green by Agnes, uh, the third life of Agnes Wada, they will talk together with Jean-Michel Frodon and um, I hope you introduce him because you know him much better. I would sudden, uh, certainly say things that are okay. He's a journalist, he's a critique, he's a professor, he does much more, but um, maybe I just let you do and um, please enjoy the wonderful evening and thank you for being here. It's still, it's a great gift and pleasure for us and for me especially to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bettina and uh, Jörg, who is not here, because without them, we couldn't have the opportunity to do that. So then Bettina and I and Jörg start talking with the whole team. Then immediately Julia had to be on board because, yeah, we discovered that we have some brain connection and it was a wonderful pleasure to work here. And the team is incredible and uh, the place is particular. And then we thought about talking about the three lives of Agnès and who else would be <laughs> on our mind than Jean-Michel Frodon, who must be the one who knows Agnès the longest, even if we can say yes, 
I know her 20 years, Julia 13 years, plus the nights makes 26 years. <laughs> and, and so we, yeah, we will exchange. We all know each other very well. So if we get too, uh, too cryptic because we are just referring to things that might not be completely, you please speak up. But m maybe you can introduce a bit more Jean-Michel and his, his background. No, you. <laughs> no, no, we're you not here to talk it. about me. We're here no, to talk it's about Agnes. It's interesting. It's very important. Yeah. It's indeed. But I, I will miss uh, certainly parts. So what I know of you, Jean-Michel, is that as a critic at Le Monde, was one of the critics I was always looking, even if I didn't want to know much about a film, but the films that got Jean-Michel's attention were for me a sign that I should give it attention to. And then he went uh, to direct the Cahiers du Cinéma, the mythical um, journal in France. And then he started teaching in several places, among which the um, École des Autres, no, uh, l'École Normale Supérieure. Science no, politics. science, oh yeah. Science well, science anyway, science one of these big science schools. Institute. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's irrelevant. <laughs> and I had also the pleasure to work several times with Jean-Michel when we at Harvard had uh, filmmakers, French filmmakers coming like Arnaud Desplechin, Claire Denis, Nicolas Philibert, except Agnès, she said, no, I don't need Jean-Michel Frondeau, I come by myself. <laughs> but uh, so we, we did this together and now he is traveling the world, doing exhibition, retrospectives. Working also with uh, many other filmmakers on books, for example, like Jia Zanke in China many others also and, and it's true that it was very nice for us to have him as a very close friend to Agnes also from the beginning from his childhood and then now on on many many projects he was very one important thing I shouldn't forget is he did uh, co direct the wonderful Chris Marker show in Paris at the Cinematheque and Chris Marker and Agnès Varda were very close friends and both were also in the forerunner to British media. I mean, Chris was more extreme than Agnès in his way of uh, using the most modern tools to do mm -hmm. things and he moved also in installation work a little bit earlier than Agnès but I think this is a double connection with your interests and, and, and also with Agnès Varda. Yeah, the, the idea was also to bring a bit more of Agnès's spirit to you. So how many things did we forget? Many. <laughs> a lot of things, but, it's, but you've said more than enough about, about me and with this is about Agnès, but this is, I take advantage of this parallel you just made with Chris Marker and the way this generation of people who were the modern generation of the, in the French cinema in the late 50s and the early 60s, uh, how much amazingly they remained uh, on the front line for decades after, afterwards and even they changed century and kept uh, being on the front row, uh, innovating, exploring, uh, daring new ways, and remaining very true to what was the, this is a disputable uh, formula, we can talk about it if you wish, uh, the new wave. But if there is a real meaning for me to this words new wave, and yes, is the first one. She, she created it, uh, even if she didn't know at the time, uh, with, with La Pointe Courte. Uh, and, but this uh, group of people, uh, those who were close and those who were not that close, but who, who were part of the same step forward, which happened in the French society and the French cinema at the end of the, the second part of the 50s and very 
beginning of the 60s, uh, had this energy, this uh, pleasure. There is something which has to do with joy, with, uh, with fun, with enjoying uh, going in new directions, doing completely different things. There, there is no such thing as a new wave style or a new wave uh, school in the sense of an artistic school. There is something of a spirit, of an innovative spirit, which has remained incredibly active. And of course, we're here to talk about that. Agnès Varda, and we're going to do so, but just uh, to, to, to begin with, she, she was, when we were together with Julia in, in China, accompanying uh, Agnès Varda, they called her, uh, the Chinese people, they called her grad, Granny New Wave. Uh, and it made sense, because, uh, of course, she, she had reached the age to be called Granny, but at the same time, she, she was still embodying this energy, this sense of curiosities, of playfulness, of uh, demanding, very high uh, level of demand at the same time. It was, uh, 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 Julia could uh, uh, testify because she experienced it and I just witnessed it, uh, that she had like one more new idea every hour, and which every, was just... Every, every minute. Yeah, that was just blowing everything out and you had to re, re, reshape, I, find solutions, technical solutions, practical solutions, financial solutions, because there was a, a new thing that, oh, this would be so great if, and, and, and let's do it. And this has been the, 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 the impetus uh, that's been there all the all the way through for all these years, all, the, all these decades. And <coughs> this was, a, uh, of course, it was like uh, uh, Dominique told about friendship and about this kind of very uh, pleasant uh, um, personal relationship. It did exist and it was great to go to uh, the house of, of, of Agnès uh, Rue Daguerre in Paris and have tea in the, in the garden with uh, the tree and, uh, and the cats and everything. But uh, very soon something would pop up uh, that would uh, just shake the, the quiet, uh, like Disturbed, a, yeah. the, you know, visiting an old aunt uh, and having tea with her, <laughs> which is fine, which is okay. But no, no, no. Uh, and say, ah, but do you know this? Or uh, let, let's see that. Or let's go see this exhibition, which is uh, on the other side of the city, and it's difficult and it's, it's not the right time. It's not. But yes, 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 yes. And there is this, um, this is uh, not, uh, not only uh, to do small talks about, you know, having met her so often, etc. It translates in her work, it translates in the spirit of her work, and it translates in what this, uh, what I could see uh, of this exhibition and this, the whole project here, which also connects with the retrospective in Arsenal, uh, the, the, the way to connect and to circulate with this dynamic uh, strength between different formats, different medi mediums, different means of expression that is addressed by the third life, or the three lives. Better said of of, um, of Agnes Varda. So so uh, it it has to do with uh, uh, what makes a, a great artist a great artist in the in in the in, in the end through this uh, this yes this energy this curiosity and this. Um, this this way to articulate something very much self-oriented and yes was very much aware of who she was and why she was doing what she was doing and something absolutely open to the world curious 
caring for others, uh, paying attention, wanting, willing to understand what's going on and how it connects and who are those people I, I see in the background and nobody's talking about them. All of this together and the way it mingles in many ways and many, many works is, is for me uh, one of the uh, very specific and, and, and powerful uh, dimension of what we can see in the, in the exhibition, uh, among other things. If she would be here, she would like to know why you are here. <laughs> <laughs> because she, was, uh, she made this proposition she was giving, but she was also really interested who is coming, but where are you coming from, what are your interests, uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it was, yeah, it was really this curiosity that you can see in certain films, uh, especially, um, is something that she was also doing in real life. It was, yeah, spending time with her audience and not wanting to know her audience, not just presenting her her material. So we wanted to speak about this title, the, the title of the exhibition we choose because it's. It speaks about this third life, but we definitely, I think, we all agree uh, to say that it's, it begins from somewhere and it goes uh, in many, many different directions. But um, you know that since the beginning she was a photographer and then she became a filmmaker, as she likes to explain it, and then she started kind of a new life as a visual artist. But it's for us definitely it's much more to say that from the beginning she was a visual artist in the frame of photography, for example, and then she became a filmmaker. She just uh, explained that she wanted to go further, that at one point one still image was not enough for her, and she wanted to explore some other fields and uh, in representation also. And, and this idea that at, at the end, uh, at, the, at that moment, uh, at the, yeah, the last moment of uh, last years of her life, she wanted to explore much more about um, different media, different uh, through installations, how you can feel the space also and the different relationship with the audience. Because uh, with the, the filming, with the, the, the space of uh, cinematography, uh, the relationship with the people were totally different, I think. And, and she was so happy also to discover that she could work in a way without thinking about industry, because cinema is still an, an industry. And only thinking in a joyful way, as you said, about uh, cr create something to share with people, but without thinking about not too much about the money or those issues. It was, I think, very important also. It, it brings light to this, this moment, but definitely I think she's the beginning and you can, I hope you will have the um, opportunity to see the exhibition or you will, you will go. Um, I think since uh, this series, for example, in Dinkelsbühl, um, made in Germany in 1960, you can see that she had the eye for the framing and the, that she wanted also to, to, yeah, to explore things uh, with uh, much curiosity for others and uh, the willing to go very close to, to people and to... Yeah, to go and, and share with them uh, before even the relationship with the audience. Yes, and just to, to follow up with what you just said, Julia, because what is true with her own photo, uh, it, it's something which is very precious to me, which is in the exhibition, which is pretty rare uh, to have access to, which was a program for French TV, public television, called One Minute for One Image, uh, which was dedicated to other people's photos, not her own. She was commenting and she was, uh, and she had a poetic and uh, political understanding of what is at stake in very different kinds of photographies. Some of them are artistic, some of them are journalistic, some of them are, are uh, doc 
documenting uh, uh, situations in a almost a scientific way, but she, she could uh, understand and, and verbalize. It's very short, it's one minute each time, so it, it has to be very sharp in the, in the expression of what do I see, I, Agnès Varda, because it's very personal. She's speaking, it's her voice, and she's speaking in her name from her subjective point of view. And at the same time, it unfolds an incredible uh, uh, array of, of, of uh, meaning or echoes of what, what is at work, which is, a, for me, an immense lesson, including of uh, filmmaking, uh, of how, how much a, such apparently simple mise en scène, uh, setting of a visual element, uh, silence, still, it's a photo, uh, is already uh, so rich. And it, she, it translates in the way she would, because what you said about her, her photos is absolutely true uh, with her films, in the, the sense of the frames, the sense of the... Uh, the camera moves, the cinema language uh, at large, and it will again be true when she becomes a visual artist in the restrictive meaning, uh, if we separate <laughs> this. And I believe, maybe we disagree on that, uh, but uh, I believe it makes sense to separate uh, these practices she was a photographer, she was a filmmaker, and she was a uh, visual artist uh, producing the works among, uh, among which many, many of, of them are here on, on display and are so beautifully organized together, which is really building an understanding of her, her relation to, to it, even if they're there a lot of others, I think this uh, choice is very, very meaningful and, uh, and powerful. Uh, and it is, but, but we, we live in a time where so many people, uh, I would say by laziness, uh, intend to mix everything with everything and say everything is images, everything is uh, uh, TV, is the same thing as cinema, which is the same thing as art video. And, and I'm totally convinced of the opposite. And I see in the uh, Agnès Varda work a wonderful uh, testimony for how much it needs to understand the very specific uh, capacities, powers, uh, resources of one medium. The medium can be with uh, a not so precise uh, definition. Visual art is very open, obviously. But nevertheless, what she does when she does an installation is not what she does when she, when she makes a film or when, when she makes a photo series. And, and this is this, um, at the same time, intuitive and intellectual. And yes, who would have refused to be called an intellectual it was an immensely both intelligent, uh, a lot of, with a lot of knowledge of culture, uh, of understanding, with a passion for uh, uh, for arts, all the arts. Uh, she, she was immensely curious of what the others did. Uh, so so she she knew a lot uh, about about, about the, in, in so many fields, and probably it did help to know what she was doing and what was meaningful in the use of different tools, which are different tools, even if she can use several tools and not only one. I, I'm so happy that you bring up the Une Minute pour une image because it is, it's a really interesting moment. Um, so it is a, a series that it came to existence one year after the film, the short film Ulysse that was inspired 
that that was from 82 and took up a photo from 54. So you see already that a photograph is the source of inspiration for a short film and the short film is extremely complex. And then 2012, I think, she combined the two into this installation. But just to come back to one minute for my image, and when she, at one point, uh, she has said when she wanted to make uh, movies, it was because she was lacking words, of course, and she discovered that movies is more than image plus word. Uh, but uh, une minute pour une image starts with silence, and the TV programmer was shocked, oh no, we cannot do that, people will complain, and so it's very short silence. And, um, and it was to just leave the image before uh, she, in the series we have here, starts to comment. Uh, but as you said, it was already also a collective work. It was 170 uh, uh, short films that she created, asking famous and unknown photographer to create these albums, and then also to ask very famous people like Margaret Duras, Cohen Bendit, uh, but also the baker in her street. Uh, so this is also so typical for her that she would give the, the people, may they be famous, may they be unknown, maybe they're friends, maybe they are on the street, the same attention and the capacity to say something about an image. So this is just a wonderful illustration of these um, and then the other thing she was saying, and this reconnects with, she didn't want to be called an intellect, uh, intellectual. She gave some rules. She said, no music, because it would besmear the gaze if you have music. No academic discourse, no historical discourse. And also, the simple fact that the title in the photograph who, photographer who made the photo is coming at the very end, is that you as a spectator, you should really engage first with the image, then with the image and the words. And I could go on because the, the, the little three extracts we have in the catalog are already speaking so much. It's about off screen and she, she says about the family photo, if I take something from my maternal line of uh, uh, descendants, I should look in the direction where they're looking. It's off screen. It's not in the camera. It's not looking like everybody else. But so she felt compelled to say, yeah, if there is something I, I have for my mother and my um, family on the maternal side is to look in the other direction, not where you usually look. And so that, this is what I find so challenging and wonderful with her, it's so, it seems to be so simple. But if you start really engaging with it, you can take so much more out. I mean, now I'm just talking about off screen, but then it's the movement of words. What do they do to your thoughts when you listen to someone? And then in an installation work is, of course, then there are totally different kind of movements. Gedankengänge, it's the wonderful German word. So you are gain, you are moving, but in German, Gedankengänge is also the movement of your thoughts in your head. And that the installation work is in fact a wonderful way to make something like very abstract Gedankengänge, something also really physical, and you are not necessarily aware of it. And this is also why I love the space. I mean, for example, you don't run in a church, but you never think about it while you are not running in a church. So what is a work doing to you in terms of, of a physical impression? Or those of you who know the Jüdische Museum, you know that there were so much thoughts giving into the space. And similarly, in an installation work, at least with Agnes Vada, is uh, it affects you physically without you consciously knowing, but it, it gives you an attitude that is already spatial uh, expressed. So just to yeah, pick up. I, I mean, the, the body is really involved totally. And from her body in, in, in the frame, uh, in the field of the, the, the what she's... Uh, of uh, our exp expression, our own expression, and also definitely in exhibition, in the way you, she, 
try to involve the 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 the, 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 the person who comes to the work of art and it's it's really important i think to you, we don't have to explain it but it's definitely true that i think you can feel it in the exhibition and in front of the work of art because there's so much dynamic there's so much movement in it and, and to be more precise to come back to what you said um, Jean-Michel I totally agree with you I think we do not have to mix everything and when she was a photographer she was totally a photographer filmmaker at that time also and um, visual artist but it's very interesting to be more precise the way for me how she could bring movement into photography and at the same time, time how she could um, feel the frame so strongly in, in uh, movies. So it's interesting to see how open uh, her mind was to bring different um, point of view in those different um, expressions. And at the end, maybe to 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 um, feel the the this uh, sensation in space to bring back together uh, movement and uh, stillness. I, I can I just add movement and stillness. It's just something very simple. You are walking down the ramp. You are opening curtain, and I can bet that you were standing still. So it's just it's don't nothing. spoil. Uh, it, I, I, I assume that you have seen it, but it's just, this is not something that needs to be very intellectual, but you have what is in the, pres in the work itself, but you as a visitor of this installation, you are also performing it yourself. I mean, I'm just speaking about going down and standing still, but I don't even know and I don't want to know what, what are your ideas, what is going on in your head, that's yours, that's your treasure. But uh, listening to, to what you just uh, said, uh, Julia, uh, it came to me uh, thinking again about the way uh, Agnes managed to be always present in her films uh, in different ways. And obviously there would be one uh, separation between documentary and fiction because in, uh, in documentary or what is by uh, to make it simple called documentary without which is as we know always uh, arguable uh, in in her cinematic work um, it's very explicit uh, the the way she she's there she she's speaking in her own name uh, uh, we see her sometimes, we hear her voice, uh, it's her neighbors, uh, where she lives, uh, uh, she Son explains and uh, the, the, the kids, the family, family. Uh, yes, uh, so, so there is no, but uh, she, she, she's more secretly uh, present, uh, in, but, but still very, very much there, uh, uh, in, in different ways, but but uh, pro pro probably uh, happiness would be one of the theme where she's very much there at the, at the limit of the frame, as I said, uh, in a, in many ways. For for instance, and then I think there is a significant turning point inside her cinema with the arrival of digital uh, camera and of course the, the use she will make of the, the DV camera with uh, le, le glaneur et la glaneus, which is in English. The gleaners and I. The gleaners and I, yes. Uh, um, and the way she would enter her, her, the, the frame in, in and, and, and use as a new possibilities of, of this uh, technical device. So the small camera, so the, the DV camera, she, she's among those who uh, understood uh, very early 
among filmmakers, I'm not talking about uh, video artists who had already uh, uh, three, three uh, or four uh, uh, steps ahead uh, uh, in, in the capacity of video first and then digital uh, as, as it came, but uh, I, I remember organizing a, a symposium about the use of, of digital with filmmakers she, in two, year 2000. Uh, she was Sh shooting uh, uh, the cleaners, uh, and she would confront all the directors who, who were there, fa famous directors, uh, photographers, like uh, Raymond de Pardon, but also a uh, camera uh, builder like uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Boviala, the, the creator of the Aton camera, uh, in the, the um, capacities and possibilities. There were two there were three, uh, Chris Marker, Alain Cavalier, and Agnès Varda, who, who were anticipating that there were new resources, uh, new possibilities to keep moving forward, to keep exploring. Thanks to that, if you acknowledge that there were some uh, <laughs> shifts that should be understood, and she, she, she made this, uh, this uh, artistic, intellectual, uh, technical, and s political, social proposal so, so important. And uh, The Gleaners is, is an important film. It's, I think it is, uh, I would like to, to uh, stress here, since we are mentioning the three lives uh, of, of Agnès Varda, referring to the three uh, practices, artistic practices uh, she had that we uh, usually uh, think of her as a recognized leading figure of modern filmmaking of the last uh, 70 years now, uh, more or less. Uh, this was not true. Uh, Agnès Varda's career as a filmmaker was like this and like that and like, like, like that very, and then again like this for a very long time. Uh, she had a huge success with Cléo after being almost unnoticed with uh, La Pointe Court except by André Bazin who just acknowledged that she was just inventing the cinema, the Cahier du Cinema was fighting for and expecting to, to come, uh, which it did happen only uh, three years later. Um, and, and then Cleo was a huge success, uh, so much deserved success. Then things went really not that well for a long, long time. Uh, the real uh, next success w w will be uh, uh, Saint-Ouenne Saint et Vagabond, which is uh, the 80s, it's, it's 20 years. She was 60. Uh, uh, and then after Vagabond again, uh, that was not so successful, nobody cares so much, uh, etc. Until the year 2000, 21st century will become the time of her glory and recognition and for reasons which has also to do with the rising of the feminist movement uh, and, and various uh, dimensions, which is great, which is okay, uh, but which helped to finally uh, give her this kind of visibility that was definitely not uh, so strong, so uh, though she made wonderful films in between and incredibly uh, innovative work in the field of documentary, in the field of feminist activism, in the field of art of cinema in, in general. Uh, and so the, the, this is also part of this multiple lines. She is someone who went through long, long, dark corridors uh, before finding ways to, to finally uh, uh, inhabit in the place she deserved to, to, to be. Uh, and which uh, explained her, her I'm not sure if versatility is the right word. But so there are three lives in her mm -hmm. filmmaking lives. Yes, there are several lives in her filmmaking lives, but the, the, the multiplicity of the lives in the film, filmmaking explains partly also uh, how much important for her it was to, to be very 
demanding for herself and uh, willing to, to, to conquer visibility with other tools as well as with cinema. Yeah, and I, I think it was so important for her to work uh, that it helped, I think, her to go through all those years because working was uh, something like, uh, you know, would bring bring her some more and more energy to do uh, further and different things. But it's definitely true that I, I discover myself when I was um, out of France that she was really much um, more well known uh, uh, even in United States as a pioneer and uh, everybody knew her for some movie, some film, some much, yeah, most of the time it was filmmaking, but as really somebody, as a pioneer, and I think it it took really time in France for us to just uh, um, realize this dimension in Agnes's life as somebody who was one very aware of many with this instinctive way of thinking and active acting sorry um this person always um before everything i think uh, um, maybe i maybe it should open afterwards i i'm very happy to talk about um, the discovery of the small dv cameras uh, with the gleaner and i because it's also uh, crucial for the installation, the videos and I, um, because, I mean, the cleaner and I, she explains already that she couldn't have talked to certain people without this little camera, so people were just talking to this little woman <laughs> and not having the impression to talk to the big camera crew. And the widows and I, as if you have not seen it, but I, I have to mention that, so there are individual conversations she could take conduct with the video, so it's very intimate, and it's one-to-one, -one. and uh, the middle screen is a 35 millimeter film, and if you pay attention, there will be also some signs that are nearly subnibble signs uh, that makes, should signal that it is film, even if we show it in a um, digital version of the film, but it is marked. And so here we have the combination, and Julia might expand on that also a little bit, <laughs> this awareness what uh, is a, let's say a bigger screen, but th that the digital allowed her to have this intimate conversation and this tete-a-tete, -tete and the installation is reproducing that as an installation because you have to sit down and even in, in an opposite, <laughs> so we have this paradoxical situation that we are all together in the same room, but we are all individually connected to one particular person. And so um, Marie de Riesek, the, 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 the writer, she said it in a very beautiful way, is this, we are all s feeling together but in a very different way. And this is at the same time an expression of the particularity what digital allowed her to do. And then the installation is to create uh, a community but where you enhanced individuality. And at the same time um, with, the, with the work itself is to represent a community but that the community is always made out of individuals. Also, once again, it is, seems to be very simple uh, as a dispositif and an arrangement and the means, but when you dig more into it, it creates layer and layers that become a really politi even political statements that are not written on the wall, but uh, are extremely important if, if we are sensitive to this kind of uh, reaction. But maybe uh, you have some questions or uh, yeah, just, so we can just hop to, out <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and to end, it's interesting also to see this back and forth because at, at that moment with the small camera, 
it's it was uh, again for her the opportunity to come back to this really close relationship to people she could have with the photo with the camera as a photographer so it's very interesting to see how with her curiosity which brings her to in different ways she could also at any time come back to people very close i think and with the installation also because now she knew at one point that you can go to a, to a museum to to see a piece and spend time with the piece and even come back to the piece and spend more time with it and i think it's uh, th this um, dimension of being very close to people was really something that moves Agnes uh, in, in her work of art. Which has even one more step, <coughs> which since she also did something which is uh, so unusual, uh, which is the fact that she went back to meet again the people she had filmed for the gleaners to film them again to see what happened to them uh, and she uh, which is already something filmmakers don't do they they go they film whatever they do uh, even great documentary works but then those who've been filmed vanish and uh, go back in the darkness uh, after have been put on the light for what they were filmed but she she wanted to to address this relation uh, others have done to a certain extent similar things it has been done it had been done to 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 go back to see the same people who had been filmed but this there was this other use she invented as far as i know of digital tools which was to uh, on the dvd of the gleaners to have the new uh, vision the, the, the two years after uh, encounters with the same people that could pop up inside the watching of the continuity of the film through this small potato that would appear on the screen and you could with your, your, your remote control uh, call for it and see what did happen to this woman afterward. Some of them were in great despair, some of them were really in trouble, some of them was very uncertain uh, conditions. So, so it, it, it makes a different relation not only to, to uh, storytelling but to, to time, to, it invents, it, it's an installation in itself inside the cinema process thanks to the digital tools. It's very simple, it's even naive with a small potato, it looks like a childish thing. And at the same time it's incredibly clever and I think it is deeply political, the, 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 the way to not let alone those who have been filmed and, and go back to, to outside of the frame and outside of vision afterward. And, and this is typical of uh, Agnes' way of uh, thinking and acting and it's yeah and to to make the opportunity to people to be to interact also with the work which means to be active and not passive in the way they are looking to images which is also very important i think being active was so important in agnes's life <laughs> i cannot even understand that she did she's dead now Sorry, <laughs> I would perfectly agree to you that she's very political in what she's doing. And for me, the image of the uh, one of the main, uh, most important images for this is when she's bending down to glean potatoes in Gleaners and I, because this is a gesture to put into attention what is thrown away and give give something which seems ordinary from ordinary lives. Uh, an importance, a beauty, etc., and that's what she does with the life around her. And this is deeply political, I think. And this idea of the political is, I see it already also in uh, Jacques de Nantes, where she films the walls, for example, old walls, as she films the skin of her husband and things like this. So she's really dedicating attention to um, what you normally don't look at, and. I have two questions. One is, 
Um, when I think of Jaco de Nantes, for example, where she mixes three layers of um, reality and fact. So it's a, it's a film on Jacques Demy, her husband, the child of Jacques Demy, and she films Jacques Demy in a documentary layer as someone who is still living but who is about to die. And she is filming his recollections uh, of the childhood, which means in black and white, she makes a mise-en-scene of this, and then she films, she gives parts of his films, and she mixes the three layers, which are colorful. This already seems to me a strategy to, to um, interweaving heterogeneous materials and going from one to the other in an associative way, which she then um, does much more um, consequently perhaps in her essayistic work in which is digital. So it would be an interesting question if perhaps she anticipated already or it was one, something she wanted to do and the digital came and it was the opportunity to realize what perhaps would not be able so easily in the, in the medium before, one thing. The other thing what would interest me is what you said intrigued me that Agnes Varda was not well, more well known outside than inside France because in Germany it's often the other way around. The more, uh, the more difficult filmmakers, we say, well, they're much more renowned in France because there's the cinephilia and this attention to art. So what may be the reason for this? I'm very happy to answer the first part of the question. <laughs> it's there from the very beginning. Uh, just uh, if you haven't seen La Pointe Courte, it's already a juxtaposition of the village of the, the fisher people, fish well, men and Fisherman. women, <laughs> and women, uh, and the romantic love story between the, the lovers. Then she had to make this commissioned work um, in order to get the status as an official filmmaker, in order to release, in fact, her film. When you look at these commissioned work that were uh, like um, uh, Du Côté de la Côte and uh, Les Châteaux de la Loire, it's totally essayistic. Uh, then she made L'Opéra Mouffe, that was her first free movie when, about which she has also said that is the, the moment when she recognized that she is a filmmaker. And it's in fragments, juxtaposition, there is no voice over, but she wrote what is something that is unfortunately not ex enough known. All the lyrics of the songs in her movies has been written by her from the quarantaine, this verses in Opera Move to the rap in the Glee Nine Eye. Uh, so there is, uh, and not to mention uh, L'une Chandre l'autre pas. So it's present from the very, very, very beginning. Uh, and it it was just evolving uh, according to different media, but it was something uh, that she was very interested in collage and juxtaposition. She had uh, loved the surrealists uh, and she made her own collage and the other thing she loved was puzzles. So to create puzzles and she also always said this always a piece missing. Or it was Jacques Demy who said to her, there's always one piece missing. But So there are other strands, and if you look back to her very early work, it's already there. Not, it can go on and on and on. I, I think it was also a way to experiment different ways of saying things, and it was also, for me, I think, a gain of time, because she wanted to do always many things at the same time. So. It's, it makes sense that in a movie you have also different levels, different directions, different meaning. Uh, it's, it's about being uh, really open-minded to everything and, and curiosity will bring more um, yeah, ways of seeing life, even in different levels and different uh, parts, collage, things like that, that make something... In, in a, sorry, it's also, it depends what you understand uh, uh, under the word montage. So if she's definitely not a classical Hollywood the filmmaker who is following anything to make it smooth, but that uh, these gaps or these little things that are not quite f fitting together, 
is something that sparks your mind. So, uh, and yeah, it, that was something very, and it goes on in her installation work in, an, in, a, in another form, but it's always this, create something that would stimulate the, the, the viewer's or mind. Uh, so that was very important to her. But all of this is absolutely true, but for Jaco de Nantes, she needed the three levels. It, it, it couldn't have been only one uh, layer. Uh, as much as Jaco de Nantes itself had to be only one of a three films, uh, complex to build what she wanted to, to share of her relation with, with, with Jacques Demy. So uh, the, the, all, all this uh, uh, capacity, witness, uh, uh, freedom of, uh, of uh, composing that comes since the, the 50s, you're absolutely right. And uh, one might add that uh, it was not only her at this time. Uh, Alain René, Chris Marker were playing this, with the same uh, freedom uh, in, in, in the, in the in, in, especially in these moments. Uh, <coughs> so that the, the, there was this openness of combination, and which has to do with surrealism also, as a, to a large extent. And the three of them were very, very much related with surrealism, at the, at, uh, especially at the, in the long after World War II period. Uh, but at one moment it reaches something emotional of another kind, which can, it's not possible to make only fiction reconstitution and it's not possible to make only documentary because it's not enough. So there is, it, for the, the way I see it, there is this urge to invent a specific, specific uh, composition uh, of, of uh, various uh, various uh, elements uh, or nature of elements, uh, which is otherwise it's not it's not uh, doing what she's trying to do as a as tribute to 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 Jacques and the. the the emotional uh, ambition that comes with with it uh, needs needs this kind of uh, combination. Who wants to answer to the second question? Jean-Michel. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, well, it's uh, obviously you you're right about the importance of cinephilia. Uh, in France, and uh, nevertheless, uh, the French cinephilia is very much uh, able to be unfair to 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 many, even more. I've just created a huge program which is called the Forgotten Directors of the French New Wave, uh, which which includes uh, 40 movies uh, of people who are more or less uh, not attracting the attention they would deserve, besides those among whom Agnès Varda obviously is, who, ca who finally have the recognition. So uh, it is a, it's probably true always with other artistic movements uh, or in different, in different uh, situations, different times and different countries, but at the moment there was this uh, stability of recognition. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard, uh, at least during the 60s, and then he's, uh, he goes in another position, but, but, but he remains very much well known uh, without uh, destruction of this recognition until, until now, whatever he's been doing, uh, which is so uh, outside of the track as, as he has been. Uh, but uh, François Truffaut with a different strategy, uh, but not all, all of them. Uh, Jacques Rivette has uh, been in the darkness more often than in the light, uh, though he deserves to me the same recognition as uh, uh, Romer built his own recognition. It took uh, four films. After the fourth film, 
he was there and he became, he's dubbed as the most profitable uh, French film director ever because his films are so cheap to make and were successful always in the proportions that make them very profitable in proportion. <laughs> I think it's, it's uh, j just to, mm. yeah, to, I totally agree with you and it's a way also to say that she was not really strategic. I mean, uh, she was willing to be, she, she wanted to be free and she was very free and you have to pay the price of the freedom also. And I think in France, if you're not exactly where uh, people are expecting you, it's very difficult to, for people to understand uh, or to, to feel uh, close to those kind of people. And for me, it's why in the United States it was easier also because uh, it's um, more easy, I think, there to have different lives, to, to try different things, to be different people in your own life. In France, I think we still have this problem of where you are is where you are, and it's difficult to, uh, you know, you have, you have boundaries. Well, let, let's not overplay the, the, the uh, American uh, recognition because in 1975, if you would uh, mention the name of Agnès Varda, just nobody knows you, who you're talking about. No. Let's mention the elephant in the middle. She was a woman. It was not making things easy at, uh, yeah, no. in those times and, and, and it took a, lo a long time. And also, when she was beginning to build a position, she left. And she went to the United States uh, because of Jacques Demy, because of her own projects, because of different reasons. And she was not there. Uh, for instance, May 68, who was, which was a very important moment in the French history on many levels. She was not in France at the moment, so she, she, she was... It part not of, at that the place uh, we were expecting her, yes. maybe. Yeah. So, so it's part of, of her freedom, yeah. but also maybe of some strategic mistakes at some point. I, I have been living nearly 20 years now in, in the States, and so it's, my per perception is, is a bit different. Um, I think for me it's machism, and it's also because the guys from the Cahiers du Cinema were clever enough to have their label, and neither Agnès Varda, nor Jacques Demy, nor Alain René were part of the new wave, so they were, they were part of the so-called left bank. Uh, that took forever to to get some kind of visibility. Chris Marker is also one of them. And uh, in the States, it's true, but there's also something, I think, in comparison, what I still remember from my years in Germany is that um, there is not there is, was a very strong uh, woman filmmaker, but in in France, every minority uh, tries to avoid to be a minority. So it's more important to be a filmmaker, but you would not walk around the street and say, I'm a woman filmmaker, or you would not walk around and I'm a birth filmmaker, or I'm a gay filmmaker. You, I mean, there are always exceptions. I simplify terribly, but there is, this is, for me, a an, an relict of the idea of the, the French conception of the Republique. It's, we are all equal, even if it is just idealistic thinking, but uh, it is something that inhabits a lot of our attitude in France that you would not put, except in certain circles, but then you are less visible if you are claiming being part of some, even if women have never been a minority, but uh, let's say, uh, if you say I'm a woman filmmaker to a certain woman filmmaker, it's like an uns insult uh, to say yeah, you are just a woman filmmaker, not a filmmaker. Excuse me, I just would like to, to kind of chime in here as a French person who lived abroad for a very long time and I wouldn't want to give entirely the wrong impression because I can totally see that maybe she never got you know, the, the recognition she deserved compared to you know, the Cahiers du Cinéma guys and everything. But all things considered, I would say that all my French friends would know a lot more about Agnès Varda than anyone else uh, here. 
Oh, <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. I mean, you were saying that, I mean, really, um, I think, yeah, I think anyone I know in France knows Agnès Varda. I mean, of course, there might be people who don't know her, you will always find them. But I think you really have, I think you have to put things in, pers uh, in perspective. And I would agree then, maybe people who know her in the States will be more into, you know, um, feminist filmmaking or filmmaking or gender studies. And maybe she's seen there a lot more like a pioneer. I don't know. But definitely, I think she's much more well known uh, in France. I mean, and again, it, it depends what, what you mean. And, and of course, maybe. No, I, I can tell you that I have friend, friends who does not know Agnes Varda. So uh, for me, it was even something strange to discover. Yeah, I'm sure there are people who don't Just know no, her. But I mean, what, what you're teaching. saying is, is about the years 2000. The what? It's about the 21st century. This becomes true in the years 2000. This was not true in the 20th century. But, I mean, Which was is by the far the longest yeah, part of her life. What I mean is compared to where, you know, like... I, I, I mean, I teach film uh, yeah. um, in, in the States, and I can tell you, I mean, just to say, Deleuze doesn't mention Cleo from 5 to 7 as a film that would perfectly illustrate his take on the new wave. Cleo doesn't exist. I teach Cleo from 5 to 7 when I teach Deleuze. My students don't know Agnes Varda, but they know the 400 blows. I can tell you that, I mean, there are always happy exceptions, but it's still like that. No, of My course. students today... Of course, today, if you compare, I mean, I totally agree that if you compare her recognition compared to, I don't know, Truffaut or like Godard or whatever, of course, of course she was never, she never got the recognition she deserved compared to them. But I'm just saying that all things considered, I would think that she's much better known, or for a very long time she's been better known by people. I mean, that's my own impression, so that would be your impression against my impression, of course, but I know, I know so many people, you don't know how many, like even friends I have, you wanted to call their daughters Cleo because of Cleo uh, from five to seven. Yeah, but, you're, I mean, <laughs> but it's true that it's, you're, you have friends uh, who have maybe children since uh, maybe 15 years or something like that. It's true that before she was totally, and I can yeah. say also that I was a student in cinema and uh, in art. I did a PhD, so I was very uh, old student and nobody in my old studies told me anything about Agnes Varda from the beginning until the end. So at the end it was, I was 32 at the end of my thesis. Mm -hmm. And, and n never, nowhere, anywhere. I mean, I, I had uh, uh, th this, um, I, I was a student in cinema. So it's, uh, in a way it's a bit weird. It's true, but it's definitely, I think that the, this third life also, with different choices, I totally agree with uh, Jean-Michel that uh, the, the choices wa was not strategic, definitely, but even uh, sometime really, uh, <laughs> as we said, uh, you, you, also t you, shoot, yeah, you shoot in your foot. It was a bit Agnes's way of, uh, of being, living, I, I don't know. Uh, and it's true that we, we discovered that at the, the end, some encounters, some, like, for example, the, the experience also with GR, people much more involved in the um, in, uh, um, internet or in the social media, for example, the communication was different and she became somebody who, who you can see on television, on TV show, or a bit, th this uh, difference she had before became something interesting for people. But it's true that it came very, very late. I mean... Uh, but we are all groupies here, so don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, now I'm, I'm, I'm just considering maybe I know very weird people in France. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's <laughs> Maybe <like> you <laughs> should <laughs> think about the, that. But the, the, I mean, I... I mean, I was so touched uh, because I live in Chicago and I did a show with her and then people had discovered her and they were, it was incredible. I mean, two things I want to say. People in the bus, because I don't have a car, I take the public transportation, they were coming up 
to thank me that I did bring Agnès Varda because they discovered her. And then the other thing is, uh, there was a journalist who knew her film and she is a groupie, she came from Chicago to Berlin to see the show. So there is this discrepancy between, let's say, uh, educated people, film goer, film students, and then those who have taste, <laughs> tasted Agnes Varda, and they're just, it's another, it's another community. But you know, like even recently, I went to a small French village, but okay, okay, that's kind of recent, it's 10 years ago, but they opened like, it's a very, no, it's not even a village, it's even less interesting than that. It's kind of a very shitty little town, and it's really an interesting town, there's nothing even like beautiful as you would have in a French town usually. I don't know, like it's, you know, built around a, a, train, a train station, and they opened one cinema, it's called Agnes Varda. Yes. So it's, it's, it's the exception who brings back <laughs> to the topic. The Agnes Varda cinema, you really have to know. And they're showing very uninteresting films. But it's called Agnes Varda. I mean, they're showing very, yeah, average films. <laughs> Mainstream. I would like to switch the subject and ask you something um, on memory. I think she, it's very important, at least in her later works to work on memory. I, I just mentioned Jacques de Nantes, I mentioned, and it's true for Glaneure et la Glaneuse, the way she takes things, people who have always uh, a history and she's interested in this history and this kind of layering and association is also a way of always going forth and back between different history uh, uh, timelines. So I would be interested first was this all because I, I do not have so well in mind her early work if it, this is something which comes later in her work perhaps with age or which is something which is there already in the beginning and is there a substantial difference because for me really this is very much linked to film to the way you do montage in film and how do you see this realized in installation work I have two mo movies that are early on. One is a really fictional one, it's uh, Vogelfrei, saint ouen loire It's about the woman and she, what we learn about the woman is always filtered through the memory of the different people she has met on her in, during the last. So it, it is already about memory and as she said, it's the impossible portrait because the impossible portrait because everybody, what every protagonist is saying about her, Mona, is completely tinted by their own ideas, projection, wishes, deception, projection, etc. So this is, would be a very fictional <laughs> example where it is already very present and also something that I connect to, in particular to the widows of Noir Moutier, because if you have seen the film, you might remember that uh, one of the last um, person he meet, she meets, Mona, is this young Arab. And when he is testament, does his testimony in front of the camera what Mona meant to him? He is just raising the scarf that uh, she has, has worn, and she doesn't, he doesn't say a word. And uh, Agnès Varda did this description for La Vincent Cinema where she describes in her own words the scene and said there are no words to express what he's feeling. And if you have seen the videos from Ram Moutier, you can remember there are no words to express what she's feeling. Or if you have seen the Beaches of Agnes Varda at the very end when she is doing this performance, the restaging of the Segal sculpture with the radio, there are no words. So uh, there, is, there is also the silence. The second extremely important movie that we have in our show is Ulysse. Ulysse is her memories, the memory of the people you are in the picture, the memory of what was going on in France at that time, what was going on in the world. So 
and it was always, uh, I mean, already very present in the 80s. And I, I can go even earlier, because if you have a look on some shorts, for example, you have, Dominic already mentioned um, L'Opéra Mouf, which is in Rue Mouftar, and it, it's, it's all about memories, because at that time she was uh, pregnant uh, of um, Rosalie Varda, her daughter, and she said that she was looking at people in the street, so it's in a black and white one in the 50s, and, and she said that she was wondering what uh, about their childhood when they were born, what as child, as, as children, they, they're supposed to be, now they are living in the street, um, very poor people, um, with, uh, without houses and any, anything. I mean, really poor people in, in this uh, old street in Paris. And it came from this desire to understand uh, they were a baby before. Now they they are old and they are living in the street, but they might have been those babies that I I'm about to to have. And there's uh, also a, a beautiful short, for example, um, about Elsa Triolet and Aragon's meeting when when they first met. And the the film is all about the meeting. So Agnes is. Ask him, ask him them to redo the meeting, when they met, how they met, um, what she was wearing, what he said, what happened, and they redo the scene many, many times, so it's, and it was even earlier, so I think it was something really important in, in her mind and in, in her work, this topic about memory from far. I don't remember the second, sorry, the second question. It goes a bit in the direction that um, the, the examples you mentioned are very much linked to the history people bring with them or, um, or things bring with them and she is interested in that and works on that. But I also would be interested in the form of uh, how she works on memory because for me the most, it's very much linked if you don't think about the way she treats she engages with people, um, it's very much linked to this associative kind of working like a stream, like a, a consciousness. It's like she's creating a consciousness of going back and forth in the way she does montage in her films. And that's what I thought, is this translated? In which way is this translated to installation work or does it perhaps, is it really linked to film? No, I think it's it's everywhere. I mean, uh, it's and at the same time, it's it's uh, it happens in really different ways. She used to say, for example, in um, this uh, movie she she has made with uh, Jane Birkin, um, Jane B uh, by Agnes V, <laughs> to translate it, <laughs> and uh, she she. Uh, she has this discussion with her and saying, oh, for me, memory is just like butterflies, but not butterflies, uh, les mouches. Flies. Uh, flies. Flies. Uh, no, okay. flies in, in the, comes back. And uh, so she has always many different images about memories. In the beaches of Agnes, she remember that uh, uh, this one disappeared, this one also. And you see that I remember this image I have made in Avignon, so a long time ago, at the beginning of her work as a photographer. And I made this puzzle now because uh, memory is just like a puzzle. You have many pieces, some, sometimes a piece is missing. So it's different images. And I think working as a visual artist was again, a different way to express itself about memory and uh, coming back to old topics, but to do something new with them and, and to, for example, the installation uh, you have here in uh, the, the Zgugu's grave, the, the little um, grave about our beloved cat is, is also something about, um, something about memory, uh, joyful memory about somebody you, you lost and um, a way to say, uh, oh, now I'm, I'm flying away from this vision of the grave of my beloved cat, but 
it's still there and it's still in this dimension of an installation and it could be in a museum, in a garden, it could be anywhere. I want to keep some images of that time, that moment in time. And um, installation brings the, the opportunity also to, to keep some things like that. I mean, Widows of Normandy is totally the, the, about this topic because uh, you, you speak to somebody who remember her life uh, with the husband and now what happened and, and when you hear the, those voices, you, you yourself, you have this dimension in, in time. But I, I would say I'm not so sure uh, about what I'm saying, at least that it can be generalized. Uh, but uh, to ma in, in many cases, I would say the presence of the, of the past and the presence of the dead in, in, the, in the present is, is uh, very active, but that it is not uh, turned backward it's turned to the present and the future. For me, the most significant, even if it seems trivial, uh, example would be when uh, there is this episode in the, the speeches of Agnes, I think, when she goes back to her child house in, uh, in, in Brussels, uh, Ixel, actually. Uh, uh, this is not about the past. This is about today. This is about her. This is about the building now. This is... Ultimately, I would say this is a difference between nostalgia and melancholy. Uh, and this is not nostalgic at all. This is melancholy. Death is inside the presence and, the, and inside our life, but not looking back, looking uh, in front. And there is this kind of dynamics, including uh, it's less clear when it relates with Jacques Demy. Uh, because there is something, uh, there, is, there are regrets in her relation with, with Jacques Demy. Uh, at least I, I feel it like, like that. There is, the, their relation was not that simple. And, and it's, it's still there and she, 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 she mourns him and he, her, his, his his death was 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 really tragic, but uh, it's more complex. So it's not always like that. But there is often in the relation with the presence of the past something which is uh, making it uh, to move forward to 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 to. to to, to look at things, it's a, it's alive, it's funny when she goes to these places, she, she's wondering how she grew up there, became, knowing what she became afterwards, etc. And so the, the, there is this very uh, um, complex relation with, the, it's, not, it's not a one direction flow of time, it's, it's, it's much more rich than, than that, the way she relates with the past. Yeah, I, I would just add another sequence in the beaches of Agnes when she should go back to the time when, in fact, the separation with Jacques Demy took place. And she, she does this Tai Chi kind of movement that she doesn't want to go back. So, there, but it is because it's very painful and then she uses some metaphoric, um, and she admits for the first time that documentaire that is a fictional version about the separation. But for me, one of the most best expression of her relationship to, let's say, painful memory is still in the videos. It's because uh, when her segment is the ties go back and forth and she, so it is that the, the relationship to the past is depending what comes back, like what seagrass is coming, what is the water bringing, and what move I am, and then it goes back, and, but it, because it's looped, it's also, it will, it will always come back. Uh, and like waves, uh, they seem to be the same, but uh, they are possibly not the same, even if in this installation. So for me, this, this movement, this constant, that you cannot get rid of it, but on the other hand, it's something that you cannot 
yeah, fix. I think this is what you probably also men meant with conscious. Uh, it is it's really something she was, I think, very interested in this this fleeting, this not that you cannot fix it or nail it down or yeah create something that would be mm. end of something. Maybe it's uh, even more complex than that because I think it was great to build the whole uh, install exhibition here on the movement idea, but it's filled with the co-presence of the movement and the fixed, uh, and it's very appropriate to open with this uh, very uh, simple and incredibly complex installation with the waves uh, which are moving and the waves which are not moving. Uh, and in the widows there is the, the, the tide, but there is a table which is not moving. Uh, and there is this two, the, what, what remains and what changes. And, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's even more complex and uh, stimulating uh, in, 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 in many, many ways. And I think we could uh, revisit the whole exhibition with this uh, angle in mind and find a lot uh, which has to do with that, what she does with uh, Ulysse. Uh, the, f the photo and the film uh, is is uh, and the, 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 the three lives uh, are dealing with that differently uh, all the all the time to, to to a large extent. May I maybe add something because you were talking about memory now, but for me it's always about life circles. I mean, it's always what you said about it's coming and going and it's going forward, but not without being um, aware of the heritage that you take with you, with the past that's always with you, because that's who you are, that's part of your biography. You cannot get rid of it, you take it, but then you don't stuck with where you are, maybe also in dark moments you go further, and that's the wonderful thing in Agnes Vada's work that I really love and admire, that although it's heavy, it's so light, and although there is... Um, death uh, also in her work but it is not it is not heavy at all it is um, funny it's joyful it's um, giving us hope so that's what I really love about it and I think this is, was one of the moments when I thought this work has to be shown here at this place that is so much also about um, coming and going and going on and uh, yeah, never and I, giving I, up and having hope and uh, being joyful yeah I totally wanted to say something who, who goes exactly in this direction because you mentioned that it was when she shows the, she shown the, those people taking potatoes and it was all about bringing things to life and it was in in her work I think it's all about bringing things to life and it's exactly the the way you you saw this uh, this place. And it, it, I think this is a reason why also it works very well because it's all all about bringing things to to life, back to life. Thanks to us. Thanks of our sharing. And yeah. Uh, question, Wilfried. It's all. It's also about memory, maybe. Uh, Agnes Varda. She was chosen. Uh, by the French to make, uh, to realize the French homage on 100 years of cinema with uh, Michel Piccoli as uh, Monsieur Cinema, um, uh, Marcello Mastroianni, and a lot of very famous actors, uh, Robert De Niro, Alain Delon, uh, Belmondo, tout le monde. Hein? Um, Sample, my, my, my question is, uh, what do you think about this film? <laughs> Nothing. No, but do you, do, you, do you know the film? Well, I like very much the film, so we can speak about that <laughs> now. <laughs> Who knows the, the movie? Only Wilfried, maybe, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Because it's a very special one, and it's true that it's uh, some... It's an object <laughs> difficult to describe and it's uh, difficult to speak about. I think that uh, it's interesting because um, Thierry Frémaux, who run uh, 
the, the Cannes Film Festival said once, oh, you know, Agnes, this movie is totally uh, underestimated. <laughs> and after years, it's going, to, it's going to be really a huge, uh, a huge important thing. And it's, it's, in a way, it's funny. I think it's the moment uh, where she missed uh, everything because uh, also it's, we could find many, many reasons why this movie was a total, uh, a total mess. But the first reason for me was the thing that she, she had really, really uh, a huge mountain of money to do this, this film. Yeah, and, and it was, it, for her, I mean, creating something from, from this point was uh, the beginning of uh, uh, huge difficulties. And it brings a uh, thing in, in different way. She tried also to have these two different uh, histories in one movie, because you, you've got two young people in love and you have the huge history of cinema at uh, another point. And the two are not working at all, uh, <laughs> the one with the, 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 the other. But at the same time, when you love cinema, and this is totally my only point of view, uh, and when you love Agnes also, when you, you know her um, a bit and you know uh, her love to cinema, to playfulness, I don't know, you can find many, many very interesting things in details in this movie. I mean, f the whole movie is not working at all, I, I agree, and uh, the, the, the editing is uh, some, sometimes uh, it's not working and neither, but there, there's some moment very precious about, for me, cinema, about uh, history of cinema, about how, how to be an actor also, and this relationship very strange she, she had with actors. It, it gives you some, some information about her relationship to actors also in, in this movie. So at the first level, I totally agree that it's a very weird and difficult film to He didn't go say in. anything. I just said yeah, I yeah, have but nothing to say. He was very open time, question. <laughs> At the same time, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one, saying things about her also. Jean-Michel, please. <laughs> I have a very bad reputation. When, when, uh, when I love a movie, then my husband always says, oh God, that's terrible, because that means this filmmaker will not make money with the movie. <laughs> But she never, she didn't make money with the movie. She got money to make the movie, which is a different. Yeah, she spent some money actually. But uh, no, uh, I think I love cinema and I love Agnes. But nevertheless, uh, uh, I have to say, uh, I'd, I'd rather was, say nothing but about we, this film. We were chatting a bit and we're saying this was the last. I mean, she made a little tiny short film, but this was the last fiction film in sense with actors and then she she started a completely di a new approach with the glean and I and yeah this is yeah, but it was also stuck into a very official context yeah. it was uh, 100 years of cinema uh, celebration by a minister of culture and a big official committee and it was part yeah, but of she something which was not we will show here very in 10th of July, another commission from the state, the tribute to the righteous of France, and she was doing this time something extremely successful. Uh, in no, but I think at the same time she was trying to do something in a comedy, and she was not very good at it. I mean, she was very joyful, very... Um, I mean, when you had the chance to live with her, and then you know it, <laughs> it, it was so much fun to be with her, to live with her, to work with her, very joyful, very, it was happiness all the time, even if it was uh, demanding and hard sometimes. And in her work, I, I think she was much more involved in deep things, and, and uh, the comedy was not really uh, something uh, for her, I think, really. Kung Fu fighting is better. Is better. Well, yeah, but it's not so... 
<rire> it has comedy dimension. Et l'une chante l'autre pas aussi. Bon. Bon. Oh, they are suicide and things like that in this movie. It's not so. Uh, it's it's and also abortion and. Uh, yeah, it's a huge subject. So it it's playful and joyful, but it's not uh, very fun uh, always. I mean, it's not comedy for me. Uh, L'une chante l'autre pas. You said that was what intrigued me. Um, I don't know Monsieur Cinema, but what you said is that you learned something about Agnès Varda's relation to actors. Yeah. I would be interested in, could you go on in which way? Because I think, again, it was not the, a good relationship uh, to work with the actors, real one. I mean, uh, stars or, um, how do you say, uh, uh, installed actors, if you go to and, and if you see uh, her, her cinema, from the beginning she started with people really unknown, even it, if it was Philippe Noiret, for example, in La Pointe Courte, it's uh, his first film, Philippe Noiret, La Pointe Courte, after he became a, a huge actor, but it was really his beginning as, as an actor, and it's the same with Sandrine Bonner in Vagabond. She was so young, I mean, she had the experience with Piala, and uh, she, Agnes, had to ask to the parents, can she come to do this movie? And so it was the only beginning. And it's in all movies, I mean, the, the, the girl who is playing uh, her, for me, in Documenter, is uh, the, the, the editor of the movie. She was not an actress. Uh, again and again, if you really look to her cinema, I think, it explains also that this film is really not working because she, she was more connected to, as she said, real person, real life maybe, and uh, inventing a world, inventing, reinventing herself and stories, but from reality and from something she has to um, uh, understand maybe. I don't know, it's even difficult to explain, but definitely, if you look at the movies, uh, it's uh, interesting the way she was really connected to people and actors well-known. Uh, it was not so easy for her, I mean. But just look at this movie, you will spend a very nice moment. <laughs> Do we have drinks now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you.